Welcome to part three on this IoT Raspberry Pi device build. So for this video, we're gonna get a little bit into sensors and what my project is on, and this is the first time I'm talking more about it, is I'm building a outdoor gardener's helping system and I'm gonna call this system Gardenia. And the point of the system is to measure characteristics around a property and give you an idea of what the quality of the soil is, the moisture, the temperature, when it freezes, when it doesn't, to give you a better understanding so you have a better idea when to plant things and are more successful at planting things. Now there's a bigger part of this project which is uh, more about ecosystems and building more sustainable farming, but I'll leave you to look at our website to get more information about that. So the first part of sensors are, there's a lot of cables and wires, and to access that, I'm gonna to need to connect everything up to this Raspberry Pi board, which we've been working on so far. But the first thing that I encountered, even before I get into all the sensors, is that there's actually no way to access these pins. Once this uh, Pi hat's on top, and this is the uninterruptible power supply that I'm using for the solar solution, I'm not actually able to connect anything to these pins. As you can see with this jumper wire, there's just no way to pass it through. So there's a couple different options to extend these pins out. And the first one is this L bracket. And the way this works is this sits on the bottom and then the Pi hat sits on top covering these pins up and I have access out the side. That's one option. The second option is just to use an extended pin head and this will push pins through the top so that I can then connect directly to them or if I want to I can add a secondary board and this is a proto board and I can use this if I want to connect um, the sensors and make it a little bit more neat. I probably will use this a little later on but for at least for the initial testing I'm just going to use a regular solderless breadboard to connect up the different parts so I can do some testing. So why don't we go ahead and connect this extender and put the board back together so we can connect up some of the sensors. Okay, now I got the standoff set correctly for the right distance. And one other nice thing is now that I have this extension on the header, I'm able to put the heat sink in. Before they, there was enough room between the two boards to put a heat sink in, so I was gonna do without it, but now that there is, I've added it back in. Very simply now, I'm gonna put the pie juice hat back on top. Now I'll put the screws back on after we test this, just in case I need to take this back on, but there, there's just a couple bolts that go on top of this, or if we add back on the proto board, we'll put another set of standoffs and then screw the proto board back on. But since I'm just trying to use these header pins for now, we're all set to go, and I can do that without actually putting the screws, again, just in case I need to take this off and make some adjustments. I've also gone ahead and added a couple standoffs to the bottom of the Raspberry Pi board. This will be used when I connect it inside the project case so that these metal contacts don't short out or touch anything else in the case that might be bad for the board. I'm gonna do a quick cleanup of my work surface, and we'll go ahead and power this back up again. I've got the area cleaned off now and I'm ready to go ahead and boot back up the Pi. But before I do that, I need to connect up some of the wires so the USB is reconnected. Now I just gotta go ahead and reconnect the HDMI and another benefit of this riser plate besides being able to get the heat sink in there is now when I plug in the HDMI, it's further away from the auxiliary power port. So now I don't need this adapter to connect the solar panel anymore. So I can take this off and it starts to clean up the build a little bit. We'll go ahead and connect that. And now we'll just go ahead and add power back in. We are ready to go. For this part of the process, I don't really need the solar panel connected, so I'm just gonna remove it again to get it out of the way. And while this is booting, I'm gonna set this aside and talk a little bit more about these sensors. Now, a little earlier, I did say that all my sensors, for the most part, were I squared C. And the reason for that is this little board right here is my I squared uh, sensor array. And this actually does a bunch of things, including temperature and humidity. It also has a pressure gauge to tell what the barometric pressure is. Now, that's not the only type of sensor I have. I also have a one wire sensor, which is this environmentally sealed thermometer. This is the one I'm gonna to use to actually measure soil temperature because it can be inserted into the soil. 
We also have this sensor, which is a moisture sensor, and this connects to this probe, which we won't need right now. The way this sensor works is it has both a digital interface and an analog interface. Now, the digital interface just tells you whether or not a threshold has been met, and you adjust the threshold with this potentiometer, so when moisture is at a certain percentage, it will trigger it to go off. However, we want to know what the moisture percentage is on an ongoing scale. So to do that, we'll have to take analog readings, and these analog readings come as a voltage. The problem is the Raspberry Pi does not have any analog um, inputs on it. So to take a reading off of this, we'll have to convert that to digital using an analog to digital converter, and I have one of those chips right here. And this chip is an MCP3008 analog to digital converter. We'll take a look at all three interfaces, including digital and serial, when we connect all these sensors up to the Pi. So now that everything's booted up, let's go and do the first thing, which is actually enable the different protocols that we'll need to connect these sensors. Go back to the Pi menu, go down to Preferences, and open up the Raspberry Pi configuration. Now the reason we need to do this is this tab right here, this Interfaces tab. By default, not all interfaces that I need to work with all these sensors are enabled. So if we go down, we can see that the first one, uh, I2C that I mentioned, is enabled, so we won't have to turn that back on, but SPI, which is what we'll be using from the analog to digital converter, we need to enable that one, and we also need to enable one wire. So I'll go ahead and click OK, and now it needs to reboot. We will go ahead and let that reboot, and while that's happening, we'll start to put some of the sensors on this breadboard so that we can make sure they work and start to put together some test code just to see what kind of readings we can get off of them. Let's start by preparing the breadboard. The first thing I'm going to do is establish these power rails. So I've put two header pins here, and I've already connected wires for the power, the 3.3 volt power supply on the ground on the Raspberry Pi. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and lay out the sensors. The analog sensor is going to take the most amount of wires. This is the analog digital converter. I'm going to go ahead and place this chip in the breadboard across this little valley in the middle, and that separates the two sides of the chip so they can be wired separately. Now that those are popped in, I'm going to put the analog uh, moisture sensor nearby so that it can be wired to that. We'll just put it right in the middle of these pins. The next one will be this uh, thermometer. This is the waterproof one, so this is the one-wire sensor. I've added this little three-pin connector on the end so it has power, um, ground, and the one signal wire. And I'll place that into the breadboard. Finally will be the multi-purpose sensor, and this is the BME280, and I'll just put that at the end. Now that we got all our sensors plugged in, uh, let's take a look at my overall schematic. What we'll do is we'll focus on each section and we'll start to wire the Raspberry Pi into the board. One wire is a great place to start because it only takes one signal wire besides the power and the ground. And conveniently, that signal wire is located at GPIO 4 by default, which is right above the ground wire that we're using to power the whole circuit. So we'll go ahead and we'll connect up that interface now, and while we're at it, we'll go ahead and connect the rest of the power to the other components in the circuit. Now that that's all wired up, there's only one thing left to do for the one wire interface, and that's to put a 4.7K resistor between the data port and the VCC power. And the reason to do this, this is a pull-up resistor, and this will make sure that that data line, when not in use, is held at a digital one. The next sensor to connect is our multipurpose sensor. Now this multipurpose sensor uses the I squared C interface, which requires only two connections for data and for clocking. The other two are just power and ground, and we've already connected those up earlier. So we'll go ahead and connect that up. The pins for this are located right underneath the 3.3 volt power supply that we're using in this project, so it's easy to find. Now on to the final sensor. So this final sensor, if you remember, is our analog sensor. So this needs to be connected to our analog to digital converter. So this is pretty easy to connect the sensor to the converter. It just requires one pin to be connected from the analog out of the sensor. 
over to one of the channels on the ADC. The ADC can be broken down into two parts. One part is the analog input and the other part is the configuration of the chip itself. So on this side of the chip are our eight channels of analog input. We're only using one because we only have one analog sensor, but having the extra seven channels means I'll be able to add future sensors to this project. The other side of the chip is a little bit more complicated and a little bit more wiring, but it's not that difficult. So let's take a look over at my schematic and we'll zoom in on this section and I'll kind of fast forward a little bit and we'll put the stuff in place. But if you need to go back, we can always rewind this video and hold the video right here and take a look at how these connections are done. The first connection on the analog to digital converter is to connect the reference to the power main. So that's a simple jumper from the VCC over to the reference. The next one is to connect the analog ground and that again is just grounding out the analog ground pin. The final connections are the ones that go to the Raspberry Pi itself, and this includes the clock for synchronizing the data and a data in and a data out. So I'm going to put a couple headers there first. You'll also notice that there is a fourth header pin, and this fourth header pin is for the shutdown, and that connects to the GPIO number eight on the Raspberry Pi. This analog digital converter uses the SPI interface, so there's two data ports, there is one clock, and there's also a shutdown system. So this is gonna connect to several ports on the Raspberry Pi. So we're gonna go ahead and connect all four of those. Alrighty, everything's hooked up on the prototype board now, so we are ready to add power and start this thing back up, then we can get into some coding. Now, I am sure that I made some mistakes in the wiring. It gets very confusing with these different chip numbers and all the pins on the Raspberry Pi, so we might need to make some corrections on where these wires go, but if you look back at this diagram, this will show you where everything is supposed to go. It's time to do some testing. So we'll need to open two applications on the Raspberry Pi. The first one is a terminal window. The second one is a program called Thani, which is an editor that will allow me to modify Python code. I've already done a sort of skeleton script, so I'll go ahead and launch that. Now that both programs are open, we can start running through some of the code that I've already created. Inside this, you'll see that this is my alpha version of the software since we're just using this for testing. And I've broken it down to a couple skeleton sections. The first one is the import of the drivers and modules, the APIs that we're gonna need to run the different sensors and also the different uh, bus interfaces. The second section is gonna be for any configuration code. Uh, and the third section is just going to be some code to get some basic readings off of the sensor. There'll be a lot more intricate coding later, but for now we just need to make sure that the sensors are actually working. So let's do a quick run of this skeleton code and see what happens. So what we're seeing here is that it cannot find the BME280 driver, and that's because we need to install this. So I just wanted to show you what would happen if it wasn't installed. So what we'll do to install that is we will go over to the terminal window and we will type PIP install BME280. The BME280 driver is now installed. I did make a mistake in the first install that I was showing in that I forgot to use sudo to install it as root so it didn't work the first time, but I did go back and reinstall it and now everything is fine. We do have to install two other packages though. One is for the SMBus 2.0. So I'll go ahead and do that in the same way that I installed the uh, BME driver. And I also have to install the I2C uh, tools so that we can check to make sure that the I2C functionality is actually working on that device. So let's go ahead and do that now. For the I2C tools, we're going to go ahead and type sudo 
apt get install i2c dash tools python dot pip Now that all that stuff is installed, we'll just go ahead and reboot the Pi and then we'll begin our testing. Everything's booted back up and I have the Python IDE back open and also I have another terminal window open so we can begin some of our tests to see if everything's working. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to rerun our Python script to make sure that the SMBus2 and the BME280 are now correctly loaded and installed inside our Python libraries. So we'll go ahead and run that. The script is completed successfully, which means that both those modules are loaded and are correctly working within the Python script. Now, for the I2C bus, we can actually run some code now that we have the I2C tools installed and take a look and see if that is functioning correctly. So we'll go ahead and look at the terminal window. You enter this command, which is the I2C detect dash Y space one. And when we hit enter, we'll see a graphical layout of our entire I2C bus. So in this case, we'll see a couple devices. I'm not sure what 14 and 68 are. My guess is they have something to do with our UPS supply. Um, but 76 is the default for the multipurpose sensor that we're using, so it looks like that's working now correctly. The second thing we can test using the terminal is we can test to see if it sees the one wire. And to test that, we go and we just type in the command ls slash sys slash bus slash w1 slash devices and go ahead and hit the enter key and now we see that it returns a device ID which means it is seeing the one wire interface so everything is looking really good at this time and we can now go ahead and enter some sample code so that we can see if we can actually get data off these different sensors now that we're ready to start programming, let's talk a little bit about the first interface that we're going to program. And that's going to be the one wire. I started with it in the first part of the hardware design, and I'll start here with the programming. And that's because the one wire interface is a little bit different than most in that it writes its data to uh, essentially a text file, a data file. So in order to program that, we're going to have to read that file in and do some processing to it. What I've done here is I've already entered the code in to save some time, and we'll just go line by line, taking a look at it and discussing the different parts. So looking down this code, we see that nothing's different in the import driver section, but we do see under configuration that there are some changes. And what I've done here is I've added this line for the variable soil temp sensor. And what this variable does is it reads in from the Raspberry Pi um, file structure, the data that's being written from the sensor. And in this case, the sensor ID is this number right here that starts with a 28. And if you remember earlier, we could find that number by running a directory list. So what we see here is the listing for that one wire device and inside that is a directory that's the name of the device or the device ID. Inside of that folder is actually the one wire file that we'll be reading in. What I've done is I've taken that, copied it into the file here and that will now read into that variable. If we scroll a little further down we can see that I've also now added this section called function definitions and right now there's only one defined function inside there. So this is the soil temp raw definition. And what this will do is it will read the raw data in from the file and then put it into a temporary file and then close back up the file on the Raspberry Pi itself. And then it will return that raw data back to the calling function. So if we scroll a little bit further down, we can see the calling function under the one wire code. And in this case, it's a simple print function. And what this does is it calls that soil temp raw and it just prints the raw data back to the console. So let's go ahead and test this code and see what happens. And there we have it inside the shell. We can see the raw data has been outputted from the sensor. Next up, I'm going to do the programming for the I2C chip, and this is the multipurpose BME280. Though before I do that, I did make a mistake earlier. When I was installing 
The driver for it, I just typed in BME 280 for PIP and it did install a BME driver, but that's not the right one. I actually needed to use the one from RPI. So it was RPI.BME280. So we'll go ahead and do that now so we have the right driver installed. Now that I got the right driver installed, the rest of the process is pretty easy. So if we take a look over at the code, there's no more imports. The BME280 is exactly the same since the drivers were actually named the same. When I used the RPI driver and installed it, it overwrote the old one. As we scroll down, we see that there is now a setup for the I squared C interface. There is a port number, there's a bus address. Now this was the one that was uh, assigned by default from the manufacturer to the multifunction sensor. And then finally we use the I2C bus and that's using that SM bus 2 uh, protocol that we installed as well. One line below that we see this thing called calibration parameters. Now the Bosch sensor itself has some fairly intricate math that's in its uh, data sheet that tells you how to do all these compensations. Luckily, I was able to download this driver for the BME and that does all those calibrations for you. So in this case, all I gotta do is set up this variable of calibration parameters and load the routine from the driver that I downloaded. So if we go a little bit further down, we'll see that I've added a new function and this one's called temp humidity pressure and that's because that's what the multi-sensor does. Um, all this does is call the sample um, function from the BME280 uh, driver. It fills in the bus, the address, and the calibration parameters and then returns the results. So when we go down to the actual code, You'll see the code is pretty simple. It's just a piece of text that tells me what it's doing. And then it just a print um, function that calls the temperature humidity pressure function and then returns those values. So we'll go ahead and we will click on run. And we can see that the data prints out. So we are successful with our I squared C interface and sensor on that. And now we can finally move along to the final one, which is the analog sensor using the SPI protocol. And this is gonna be the analog moisture sensor that uses the ADC and is connected to the SPI interface. Now to test this out, I do have the sensor probe attached and I have it in a glass of water over here so that we can get some kind of reading. And let's go ahead and take a look at the code for this sensor. First up, we'll notice that there is nothing different in the import drivers modules again, except this time we will be using the SPI dev that we imported earlier. If we scroll down a little bit, we'll see that the SPI interface does take a little bit of setup. So the first thing I did here is you'll see this first line, SPI analog equals SPI dev dot SPI dev. And this just sets up the SPI object. The next one, SPI V reference. This is the reference voltage, so this is 3.3 volts. Uh, that's what I have it connected to, and this will control what the scale is like um, as we read in the sensor. So now let's take a look at the function definitions. So I have one new function for the SPI analog read, and this function is gonna take two variables. One is channel and one is the VREF. The, the VREF is the reference to the voltage for the scaling and the channel is which channel you wanna read. In this case, the ADC that we're using, the MCP3008, is an eight channel analog to digital converter. So you just input the channel zero through seven and it will read that particular channel. So looking further down at the code for this, the first one just opens up the object the next two print commands, just make sure that the channel is read right in right as is the reference. This next piece of code, it starts to get a little complicated, so I'm not gonna go into detail on this, just saying that it's beneficial to put this in place. The first one is the max speed in hertz. This sets the maximum speed of the reading. This next line, take reading, um, this is using bitwise um, logic. So in this case, all you really need to know is that this is sending a command to the ADC to take a reading of whatever channel you've sent to the function. So if you see channel here, channel here, that channel is what's gonna be read. So next part up is a print just showing that it is taking the reading. The next line is this ADC value and 
this is where we actually are taking the reading off the sensor. So we told it to take a reading and it read it into the sensor's memory and this is pulling it back out. The last one is just closing the object up again and then we're just returning that ADC value. So this is just taking the raw data and returning it back. Now that we're done looking at the function, we can scroll down to look at the test code. And the test code for this is pretty simple. All we're gonna do here is we're gonna put a uh, quick text block in to show what we're actually doing. And then we're just gonna print two different SPI analog reads, one for channel zero, which does have that moisture sensor connected to it, and one for channel one, which has nothing connected to it. So we'd expect to see something for channel zero, but nothing on channel one. So we'll go ahead and run this script. And here we can see that the the test output from the ADC is fine. Channel zero is reading a 504 value, which we were expecting. We were expecting to see something. Channel one, which has nothing connected to it, is reading all zeros. So that's exactly what we thought it would be. So we now know that the sensor is working fine, as is the ADC. Thanks for watching our video on sensors and the Raspberry Pi Zero. I hope you learned a little bit about the different interfaces that you can use for sensors, including the one wire, the SPI, and the I squared C and a little bit about analog digital converters. So if you like this video and you like this content and you wanna see more, be sure to subscribe to our page. You can click the little subscribe button below. And if you wanna get notifications whenever we come out with new content, make sure you hit that little bell icon as well. So until next time, happy programming.